Good evening or morning for some of you, and welcome to our seminar, Retiring for Work, A Lifetime of Serving the Lord. It's great to have people from Uruguay, from the USA, from the UK, and from every state and territory in Australia, though I'm not sure if there's anyone listening from Tasmania, um, sadly, but maybe next time. My name is Jane Tua. I serve on the faculty here at Moore Theological College, and I'm the director of the Priscilla and Aquila Centre. The Priscilla and Aquila Centre is pleased to co-host this event with the Gospel Coalition Australia. The Gospel Coalition helps people know God's word with their mind, love God fully with their heart, and engage the world with grace and truth. Their website has many excellent resources that you might find helpful in your Christian walk in ministry and evangelism. The Priscilla and Aquila Centre is a centre of Moore College. It was established for the encouragement of the ministries of women in partnership with men. It aims to think through seriously and creatively the application end of complementarianism. We have many resources on our website that you can access, including talks from previous Priscilla and Aquila um, evening seminars and conferences, and we also advertise ministry positions for women. Next February, we have our annual conference. This conference is primarily aimed at men and women in vocational ministry, though each year we have um, other Christians come along and they're most welcome to come and attend. Our main speaker next year is Gary Miller, the principal of Queensland Theological College. Gary will be speaking on Genesis women, why the patriarchal narratives aren't patriarchal. His wife, Fiona, will also give some input into the plenary sessions with Gary. There are 10 electives to choose from, covering a range of biblical passages and topics. You can find more details on our website and registration for that conference is now open. It might be that you're interested in studying with us at Moore College. We have a wide range of courses available to better equip you for ministry, whatever shape your ministry um, takes, um, either as a congregation member, someone already in vocational ministry, or someone who is considering vocational ministry. We have online courses and face-to-face -face diplomas, degrees, postgraduate study. You can find more information about the range of courses we offer on our website. You can contact us and come and sit in on some lectures, come and meet some of our students and faculty to get a better picture of what studying here at Moore College is like. Get your questions answered. We would love to hear from you. Back to our topic for tonight, retiring for work, a lifetime of serving the Lord. A couple of years ago, one of my sisters heard a talk on retirement by Peter and Christine Jensen. And as my sister was sharing their talk with me, I thought this would make a really good Priscilla and Aquila Centre talk. I approached Peter and Christine and thankfully they said yes and here they are. Peter and Christine Jensen have been married for over 50 years. They have five children and love being grandparents to their 25 grandchildren and they are expecting another grandchild in January. Peter is the former Anglican Archbishop of Sydney and a former principal of Moore College. We still have the privilege of Peter lecturing for us. Christine Jensen has been involved in numerous ministries over the years, including itinerant speaking, mother's union, ministry wives, and helping out with giving feedback to the proclamation groups here at Moore. What's gonna to happen tonight? Peter and Christine will give their talk and then they will answer questions. You can text your questions throughout the night to the number that was on the email that you received yesterday or the person that registered for you on the email that they received. I'm gonna pray for us now and then I will read Psalm 90. So let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you are always at work. We thank you for the privilege we have in being involved in your work. We thank you for the many ways you have gifted Peter and Christine, for your love and mercy to them. We pray for them as they speak to us now, that they will honour and glorify you in all that they say. We pray for us as we listen, that we will be free from distraction, and that we will come to a deeper understanding, 
appreciation and joy of what it means to be servants of you, working for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please open your Bibles to Psalm 90. Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it was past or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favour of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Thank you, Peter and Christine. Thank you, Jane. And uh, Christine, I would like to express our gratitude to uh, Jane, first of all, for her invitation, but also to uh, the Priscilla and Aquila Centre and the uh, Gospel Coalition Australia, both uh, ministries which we heartily approve of and are uh, part of and benefit from. We're very, very grateful indeed uh, to be here in Moore College uh, and uh, be part of this tonight. We thank uh, Jane's sister too for uh, exaggerating, obviously, how wonderful this talk was a few years ago. Uh, and uh, the main thing is that Christine and I are still here to repeat the talk, so that's good. I have to say uh, as well uh, that uh, neither Christine nor I are counsellors or uh, psychologists. Uh, we're not medicos. We don't have that sort of professional training. Uh, rather, we are both uh, students and ministers of God's word. And uh, what we bring tonight is the word of God uh, with our own experience and thought about our own experience. And that's what it is. Uh, and I trust that it'll be a benefit uh, to those who are listening and, and watching tonight and those who will hear and watch uh, later on. As uh, Jane has indicated, I'm going to start uh, with a uh, study really uh, based on Psalm 90. And then after a while, uh, Christine will come and she will uh, take on the task of particular application of what we have here, uh, particular application to us, uh, those of us who are retired, and those of us who are thinking of retirement or who one day will be retired, and I think that means even our unborn grandchild. Let's remind ourselves as we begin of the ever-increasing contrast between the secular world and the secular way of thinking and the Christian way of thinking. Uh, even in the last decade, that contrast is more and more clear. But it's been building up, particularly in Western nations, it's been building up since the 1960s. 
and we are clearly rowing in two different boats going in different directions. Of course, the secular world, unwittingly, unknowingly, owes a great deal to the Christian world. But nonetheless, uh, there's a, a distinct feeling that uh, people no longer want to be called Christian, no longer want to honor the scriptures, want to have their own way, and uh, a feeling too amongst Christians that we are being pushed into a minority position. These views play themselves out in a myriad of ways, but not least in the way in which we finish. We finish the race. For if you take a secular view of the world, we're really thinking that we human beings are nothing more than, if you like, rather superior animals. And in particular, there is no life beyond. There is no hope for life beyond. This life is all we have and all we are. Whereas we Christians believe that we need to be and are saved through the great work of our Lord Jesus Christ, that that great work has within it the resurrection from the dead and that we have a hope of glory. Indeed, that even this life we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another and then in the life to come when we go home we will have a weight of glory and be in the presence of our wonderful and marvellous master. What a difference, what a contrast between these two ideas. It's interesting to listen to the secular voice in contemplating therefore age, retirement and what lies ahead. One of the phrases that people use is the golden years. The golden years are defined, in case you're in any doubt, the golden years are defined between the age of retirement, say at 65, and the next 10 years are the golden years. When the money you have accumulated, you can spend and spend on yourself. When you can, when you can have the experiences, do the things, get involved in what you want to do without the burden of work. Indeed, in an article I read a little while ago, uh, there were complaint from those who had breached the golden years uh, that the grandchildren were getting in the way and because uh, so much more now was required of uh, older people, uh, people were uh, uh, having to look after their grandchildren and so their golden years were slipping away. I always think that this means that people believe that there's a sort of a heaven, yes, still, but it's a heaven on earth. You have to experience heaven now because there isn't one later. And so we've invented a new heaven called the golden years. Isn't that marvelous? Well, that's one element of the way people think. Here's another one. Uh, I remember once uh, being in the, a foyer of a, of, of a, uh, of a great building and uh, a, a contrompse broke up. Uh, there was a, a fight going on. Uh, and a, a, a lady was there and she was rebuking one of the people working there and in a, a wonderful classic moment she rose to her full height and said I am a lawyer <laughs> as if somehow it was an astonishing thing to say I am a lawyer and you could only think that she somehow defined herself by her work that because she was a lawyer that made a difference to other people that it gave her a status and it must have been that uh, and I wonder how retirement works for her when she is no longer a lawyer but is simply retired and non-operating any longer that was interesting and here's another one a, a famous chef uh, from the United States now deceased once said words to this effect he says my body our body is a playground not a temple our body is a playground not a temple interesting isn't it that's secular that's the belief yes yes the temple the idea of the temple which is in the scriptures of course that our bodies are the temples of the holy spirit no 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 he says no it's our bodies are given to us so that we can play with them we can eat whatever we like we can do whatever we like in saying that, of course, he is only saying, he was only saying, 
you be you. He's only saying uh, that the ego must triumph, that our quest in life is freedom, the freedom to be the person we want to be. Isn't it interesting, by the way, to see how many uh, of our schools are saying the same thing and our universities are saying the same thing. Come here to study uh, because we will enable you to be the person you want to be. So that the message that uh, young people are receiving constantly is your life is your own uh, and you must make of it what you will, uh, whatever that may be, and you must be the person you want to be and your body is a playground not a temple. Of course, the body decays. If you look straight ahead towards me, you will know the body decays. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it, when you, people talk about the golden years, it's as if they've never heard of arthritis, uh, for a start, if I can put it that way, uh, and they've never heard, apparently, of grief. For after all, it is often during those golden years that if you have a a married partner, if you have a husband, a wife, that one of you may well die at that stage and your golden years will be no more. Isn't it likely indeed? If not during those years, then shortly after. Indeed, if you look back and stand back now and look at the secular world and listen to those who are telling us what's going on in the secular world, the words that people are using are as follows. This doesn't make sense if you're a secularist. Anxiety. Deep anxiety. Substance abuse by people in their middle ages, let alone the young, and of course alcohol abuse at all ages. Entitlement thinking. I am a lawyer sort of thinking, but not she alone, for there's so much entitlement thinking. Your GP will tell you that. People come in and they are entitled to be cured of whatever it is that ails them. A growing, a growing aloneness as we destroy the family structure and people are particularly now middle-aged elderly alone and lonely. It's worse in every generation. And money does not fix it. What we want to say as Christians is that we have, and I'm going to choose the title of one of my favourite books here, A Better Story. We actually have a better story. It's interesting, I read an article recently on, on uh, the impact of faith on health. And there's a whole list of physical ailments and in every one of them, except one. And that was to do with the, uh, the fatness of the body. Uh, those people who had faith were better, physically, let alone mentally. Not always, of course, by no means always. We too suffer, of course we do. But there is a way in which the life that God has laid down for us is far better for us in this life, let alone in the life to come. We have a better story. Now, in this psalm that uh, Jane read to us tonight, Psalm 90, coming from Moses, in this psalm, we hear the word of God. We hear the word of God as the psalmist reflects upon human beings, upon our age, upon our life in a profound way. And I want to now take us through this psalm again and just pointing out some of the particularly relevant things because after all, what we're doing here tonight, we're, 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 as I said before, we're not psychologists. We're not sort of aiming to give you sort of tips for old age or something like this. Our aim is rather to say, what is it that we have from God which enables us to live, whether in old age, whether in retirement, whether indeed as we go through life, the better story? The better story. 
And so here we have uh, the, uh, the psalm and its three elements. And it talks first about the Lord of our age. The Lord of our age. And then in the second part, the body of our age. And then the third part, the hope of our age. Okay, ready? Here we are. First of all, the Lord, the Lord of our age in verses 1 and 2. For what we have, I still remember my older brother saying to me uh, when, I, when we were, I was a very young child, he said, do you know the first words of the Bible? No, I said. He said, in the beginning, God. I've never forgotten that moment because that's the good news. That's the glad tidings. We are not without God, but nor are we surrounded by God's many not sure which one to appeal to, which one to relate to. No, there is one God, the maker of heaven and earth. And listen to how he's described here. You have been our dwelling place, our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you'd ever formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In a world of chaos, in a world of struggle, temptation, in a world of sadness, in a world which threatens. There is one rock. There is one that stands firm. There is one who is from everlasting to, I read these words this morning and a shiver <laughs> came over me at the thought. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And you are our stronghold, our safe place, our home. That is who he is. He is the one true God. He is the everlasting God. We have security in him. Of that we may be assured. And he is, now this is terribly important, he is the sovereign God. For as you retire, as you move into the elderly part of life. Now this needs, is terribly important at every stage, but as we move into retirement, it is all the more important to know that underneath are the everlasting arms, that our God is a sovereign God. He is sovereign over all things. Do you believe it? One of the most wonderful things in the world that you can do is to believe it, to trust it, to trust him and to be assured of him. He can be trusted at all times, no matter what is happening. This is wisdom. You want to be wise? Not everyone who gets to retirement is wise. There are some very foolish old people around. <laughs> but the greatest wisdom in all the world is to fear God this God, the sovereign God. And then uh, Moses begins to talk about the body that we have, the body of our age. There's a contrast between God and us. For he says, um, uh, you uh, a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it's past. And then talking of us, you sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. We are brought to an end by your anger. Human life, we know this, you know this. We don't want to admit it, but we know it, is fragile. It is short. A thousand years in his sight are as nothing. But for us, if we live 70 years, that's good. If we live 80, that's astonishing. We know the truth. And we must know the truth about ourselves. There's an interesting verse, isn't there, in verse 12. Here's a prayer. This is not a bad prayer for you, for me. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Teach us to recognize our own frailty, to number our days, to recognize that unlike him, we are not everlasting to everlasting, but we are but human, frail, human beings even in the world of science and of medicine 
in the end an incurable disease will bring you down. Whatever the sufferings of this world, alienation from God is the worst. Whatever the sufferings of this world, alienation from God is the worst suffering. He tells us in verses 7 to 11, You are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, uh, before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Our days pass away under your wrath. That's the truth. That is the awful truth which human beings love to <laughs> shut their eyes to. Like you may have little children sometimes close their eyes and hand over face rather than see something. And that's what we're like. We will not look to the truth. That death is judgment. It's not just a natural end to life. Death is judgment. And it is the door that opens to judgment, to the day of judgment. Which, where you and I and all human beings will one day stand before the judgment seat of God under his wrath. And so your first job, your first retirement job, indeed your first job all through life, is the fear of the Lord, is to make sure that your relationship with him is based upon the truth that Jesus Christ died for you, that you may be cleansed of your sins, that you may be justified by faith, that you may have peace with the God who is deservedly angry with you. Not alienated, but reconciled to the God. That's your first job, whatever stage, but certainly now. This must be you. For he is the hope of our age, finally, verses 13 to 17. He tells us, uh, return, O Lord, how long? He calls out, return, O Lord, how long? He says, have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning. Isn't this wonderful? Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Listen to the word, satisfy us with the love, that we may rejoice, that we may be glad. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your works be shown to your servants, your glorious power to your children. We are the children of the living God, for we have peace with God. That is us. That is the truth about us. He then is our hope. Look at the last verse, verse 17. Let the favor of our Lord. Here's a prayer. Let the favor of our Lord God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Why should he? We are such, we are such grasshoppers. Establish the work of our hands, dear God. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Establish your work in us and make us the sort of men and women that we should be, changed from one degree of glory to another until in the end we stand with our Saviour home at last. It is this God who satisfies us, gladdens us, shows us himself and establishes us. This God and no other. Now whatever else your experience of retirement or age is, however good it is, however burdened with grandchildren it is however sad it is if you know God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit you have an assurance and a hope that the world does not have and it's not just mythical, it's not just made up it's not just given to you to make you feel better it's the truth your hope is real and so he gives us the following. Ready? He gives us assurance. The world does not have assurance. Those who belong to God have assurance. Assurance of his love for us. We are loved. <laughs> you don't need to go around saying, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> I'm a child of God. That's what matters. <laughs> Whether you're a lawyer or a street sweeper. It makes no difference. You are a child of God. Your true significance is in your relationship with him, not in, not in the work you happen to do. 
assurance and security. You are a child of God. You have hope. You have hope arising from purpose. Uh, God has a purpose for you. God is going to take you frail, weak, sinful human being that you are, and he is going to make you into the likeness of his son. That is your great hope. So far, even though you might be 90 years old, or a friend of ours is 99 years old, you're a child. We're still all children. We're still waiting for the day when we will be at last with him and be adults. And on that day, our hopes will be fulfilled. We don't have hope like optimism. We don't have hope like some people have a vague hope. We have a real hope, a substantial hope. Work. Well, <laughs> I met, I was uh, talking to a, a, a brother from the United States the other day, uh, Archbishop Foley Beach, and Foley said to me, you're not retired, he said, you're redeployed. And I think that is just the, if you never hear anything else tonight, apart from, of course, what Christine says, but if you never hear anything else tonight, I reckon that's it. A retirement, what's retirement? You see, our daily work by which we get our daily food and all those sort of things is very important and the Bible tells us so. But it's not life, it's not the whole of life, it's not the whole of our labours, not at all. And so when uh, that stage of our life finishes, we move into other spheres, but we don't stop working. We don't stop working. We may change jobs. We may now be doing things which uh, we weren't doing before, but we are redeployed. We never cease from work. No, never in this life. Redeployed for the service of God and the glory of God. We have work. We have fellowship. This is what Christians have, that the unbelievers have little understanding of, the community of God's people, which means so much to us. And we have wisdom. I'm a wise man. I know I am. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. That's not a boast. It means that God in his mercy has enabled me to know him. And that is the great wisdom. But I also have experience, and so do you. As you retire, you've had an experience of life. And if you've lived your life under the word of God and with God and walking with God, you have, you have a wisdom, you have an experience and a wisdom through the word of God and through your life walking with God, which is something special, which young people by definition do not have. And you too have your special role through the wisdom that God has enabled you to accumulate. Now we want to think of the reality of all this in everyday life as Christine and I have experienced it. We have actually been retired or I have been retired from my day job, I should say, for seven years or put it another way, I was redeployed. She has never retired as far as I know. That word has never come across your, has it? Are you a retired person, Christine? Tired, maybe. But <laughs> tired. <laughs> but You're retired? Tired? I don't feel retired. I might look retired, <laughs> but I don't feel it. I see. Okay, that was good. And so you're going to tell us, you're going to speak to us now, and you're going to tell us about uh, some of your insights about the work we can do and do do in our re redeployment. Redeploy I like that word. That's a good word. It's isn't pretty it? good, isn't it? Yes. Thank you, Foley Beach. Okay. Well, I know I don't feel old inside, but when I stand up sit, after sitting down for a while and my knees are stiff and I look in the mirror, it becomes a reality, a real reality. I've noticed actually that the hairdresser has stopped offering to color my hair. <laughs> I have my own colors now. But as Peter said, we still have work to do because as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the good works which he's prepared in advance for us to walk in. I'll say it again. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus 
to do the good works which God prepared in advance for us to walk in. It doesn't say that the good works cease when you're ill or you're busy at work or when you retire. We are God's workmanship every second of our lives. God loves us and cares for us and he's prepared good works for us to do right to the end when we go home to be with him. We've given up work, but does that mean we are no longer workers? No, because our whole life is intended to work for him. And in this season of life, this redeployment that I'm now in, what work do we do? There's that verse in, that Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4.16 that says, We do not lose heart. Now this is me. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed daily. It certainly um, hits you whenever you look at your wedding photos, not to mention your physical limitations. But there is such a thing as improving with age, you know, um, in all aspects of life that you might have forgotten about. The time for deeper relationships, for fresh interests maybe, and opportunities that the Lord given you. But what are these good works that God gives us? You might say, surely I've done my bit. There are, but there are many good works we can do. And I think the hallmark of good works is generosity because God has been generous to us and in giving us the Lord Jesus. Ask yourself, how can I be generous with my time? How can I be generous with myself? How can I be generous with the money in supporting good causes? Does my minister need me to pray for particular things? Do I ever ask him about that? How can I support my church family here? I have a, a friend and when they moved churches, she decided that um, every day, every time she went to church, she would speak with someone new. Um, we don't like doing that sometimes. We think no one wants to talk to us. But actually people do, they do. And you know, if you took early in retirement, there might be an opportunity for you to move out of the city and go to the country and support a church in a country town. They would love you there. We have friends who moved like this and my goodness, it was a rich time in their lives as they served the Lord there. I met a 91 year old man in a shop that I volunteer in and I was chatting to him and he said, well, you know what? Now I organize the rosters at church and he does it without complaint. My father-in-law who lived with us for 16 years, he used to collate um, a church newspaper on our dining room table every month. Um, everything, he had been a printer, so he knew how to do it so well and do the mail out. I've learned great skills from him. But here's a radical thought. What about walking into church and not sitting in your usual seat and looking for someone you don't know and or a new person and sit beside them. You don't have to give them the third degree. The best thing you can say is, tell me about yourself. You know, everybody loves talking about themselves and that's a good way in. We need to minister to each other and not expect others to do it. Can I challenge you to think of life in terms of Christian witness and keep asking yourself each day, 
what can I do for the kingdom of God today? And then at the end of the day, think of three things you can give thanks for and write them down. You know, it doesn't take very long to develop a habit. If you did that for three weeks, you would actually have a habit. Asking what you can do for the kingdom of God today and then writing down three things that you would thank God for. Do you have any suggestions? Yes, well, as you know, we moved into an apartment when we, uh, you know this because we moved into this apartment. Yes. Uh, very careful not to have a lawn to mow though, right? Indeed. Yes, Indeed. yes, so uh, minimal looking after. Uh, today I rang up uh, a friend of mine at uh, Anglicare, our big organisation here in Sydney, very big, and said to him, uh, volunteers, do you guys look for volunteers? What's his answer? I bet he said yes. Well, he leapt down the phone. Uh, he said, yes, we can use volunteers for all sorts of things. I don't know if you've thought of that. Uh, but this is a moment when you are self-supporting and able to, it's not just Anglicare, I've mentioned that in particular, but I know CMS. We, we had some friends who helped out at CMS for a long time, didn't we? Yes. And. Um, uh, Anglican Aid would be an... Uh, I should stop mentioning them because I will leave someone out. But certainly, uh, all sorts of different work could be done at Anglican. Another one is um, uh, teaching English as a second language. Yes. Have we got friends doing that? We do. We do indeed. And actually, I, I kind of help some Sudanese ladies oh. read the Bible. Is that where you go on Saturday mornings? Well, once a month anyway. OK, tell me what you do. Well, I go to Blacktown and with a, uh, a friend, we help the Sudanese ladies to read the Bible in English. Um, they can't really read their own language, so this is a, a big thing. And telling a Bible story being translated into Dinka and Arabic and trying to de conduct a discussion At group, the same time, more or less. Yes. yes. Is, um, has been an interesting experience, but it's wonderful to be able to share their faith in the Lord Jesus. Because have you got anything out of it yourself? Yes. Yes, you come home very tired. <laughs> I think I've learnt to understand, to try and tell the Bible in stories, yep. to try and explain it more clearly to people. Yeah. And you've met some wonderful ladies. Yes. Yes, the, I have indeed. Yeah, yeah, who you would never normally have met. That's right. And yeah. I look up to all of them. <laughs> yes. Yes, that was a joke. Um, uh, sort of, in case you missed it. Yes, yes, very good. So, uh, in sum, what you're saying here is that uh, the time that you may now have as a retired person uh, should not be wasted, but can be used in voluntary work uh, and you only have to look around for a while and you will find the voluntary work around your own church. Christine mentioned praying for the minister. Uh, that'd be a good idea. Yes. <laughs> and the, and the uh, other things the minister wants prayer for uh, as well. Sorry, I'm beetling on. This is your talk. That's okay. Yes. <laughs> Did you hear so that? We are... She's very nice to me sometimes. Yes. Yes. So we have good works. The Lord has given us good works to do. But secondly, this is a time of prayer. This season of life we find ourselves in is ripe for prayer. I know that you are still busy, but there is less pressure and time constraints. And we are therefore able to give ourselves more fully to prayer. When Peter was principal at Moore College, he often found it was the students' grandparents who were Christians who had prayed for their grandson or granddaughter that they would know the Lord. What a special task that is. My friend Francis is able to move the world through prayer, even though she's 99 and she's in a nursing home. Mind you, she evangelises the other residents and the nursing staff as well. And we can still move our Lord, our God, who moves the world. God 
uses our prayers to rule the world. Our mental and physical powers might diminish, but our spiritual powers increase as we learn to pray in accordance with his will. And you know, as the word of God dwells in our hearts and minds, we are able to pray according to his will. You know, Jim Packer said, I draw strength from God by prayer for faithful obedience through thick and thin, an energetic refusal to be crushed by strain, perplexity and discouragement. Pray, I mean, this isn't just for when you're redeployed, this is always. Pray for your children, their marriages, your grandchildren, your godchildren, nieces and nephews. And I especially pray for my grandchildren who are teenagers, that God will protect them from themselves. I pray they'll never be ashamed to know the Lord. I pray that God will help them stand firm for Jesus in face of opposition. I pray that they will have Christian friends and marry Christian partners. So prayer is the center of our life, the center of our good works that God has given to us. And then there's relationships. You know, as you get older, you, an older age gives you opportunity to reflect on life and the opportunity to get our relationships in order. God puts us in families, doesn't he? But they can be the source of great joy and great sadness. You know, that's why Christmas Day is often one of the worst days in the year as people struggle in their families with relationships. We met a chaplain in Anglicare who worked in the retirement villages and he, we, we asked him, what do men talk about in their older age? And he said, it wasn't their work, but their relationships and sometimes with regret, but also sometimes with joy. So in our relationships, there are so different categories. There's broken relationships, isn't there? In my own family, my birth family, there was a rift between my mother and her sister, such that my mother never talked about her and I never knew her. I only knew that she existed and there was a photo. How sad was that? How sad was that? But I'm sure my family's not unique. And I realise that sometimes there are deep hurts in families, deep hurts, not just in families, but with friends, and reconnecting seems impossible. But you know, we need to ask the Lord for his wisdom and, and seek to work out these challenges. There's no easy answer, but you know, no problem is too hard or too big to bring before the Lord. We might need even to seek forgiveness from those we have personally alienated and then from God. But, here's a but. Forgiveness, I think, is a process. It's a process. And it doesn't always mean reconciliation doesn't mean it might be like it was before, but it is a process and we can ask the Lord to give us courage to seek to restore those broken relationships that we might have in our lives. It'll be hard, but God is a great God and we know he will be with us as we begin those things. ask you a question yes. about that. 
Um, just to think, go back into history, of the, those who have now passed away, of your mother and her sister. Okay, what do you think your mum should have done or could have done under those circumstances? What, what would you have done, do you think? Well, I don't know what caused the rift. Okay. But it was a rift on both sides because I have since been able to connect with my aunt's um, granddaughter mm. and we've been able to talk about it. Isn't that wonderful? And my aunt yeah. was as stubborn as my mother. <laughs> so, you know... Um, oh, really? <laughs> I'm not stubborn. No, 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 of course not. Yes. <laughs> um, but, but I think I would have liked my mum to at least introduce me to her and to make some reckon some point of being in contact, I, I would hope that that would be happen. But sometimes words are very hard to take back, you know, and people say things and then it's hard to go back. Yeah. Um, but maybe someone listening to this needs to pick up the phone? Yes. Or even a text out of the blue. Texting these yeah. days is yeah. kind of a depersonalised way of getting in touch even just to say I've been thinking of you and think and um, I've been praying for you maybe if you could do that can we meet for a cup of coffee or something like this maybe maybe that might be too big a hurdle hurdle yeah but I think you can do something like that right I okay. would think well um we had an interesting experience, didn't we, when we spoke at a grandparents' conference a little while ago, and uh, the thing that, uh, I don't know if you recollect this as sharply as I do, uh, what I would say was the pain in the room. Yes. I, I was surprised, and it was out of this broken relationships. That's right, that you people couldn't see their grandchildren, so it's not just across siblings or with their parents, it's often um, with one generation to another. Yeah. And maybe there's all sorts of things that go to make up disagreement and disharmony in family yeah. life. Yeah. And sometimes they are those hurdles are too big. Or maybe something's happened yes. where um, and you've experienced people who had great trauma in their lives. Were they ever able to forgive people who you might like to talk about it's, that. Um, well, you've mentioned forgiveness, and uh, of course I totally agree with you, that we're called upon to forgive as Christians. Boy, here is an issue, isn't it, for, for, for us at any stage in life, but it's an issue for us as we reach the point where we're looking back over life. Can we forgive? The Lord calls us to forgive. Can we do so? And I think uh, what Christine says is great wisdom. In a sense, we decide to forgive and then we practice forgiveness. Uh, it may not mean that you will ever get in touch with that person. It may be that's just not possible any longer. You've tried and tried. but Or they could have died. Uh, or they could have died, but you haven't forgiven them. No. And so uh, there needs to be forgiveness, but it, but, but it, it needs to be a recognition that it's not an easy thing and that it's a... It's a it's an, it's an activity in which you decide you will and then you practice your forgiveness. I think that's how I would see it. And I think you're right to say that it doesn't necessarily mean to lead to reconciliation with the person because if they don't wish to be forgiven or they don't care, then you still may forgive them, but you may not be reconciled to each other. Mm. It's a tough area. I think, and there's a lot of deep hurts in in families, but in all yes. sorts of relationships. Uh, indeed, uh, yeah. yeah. And so you very kindly didn't mention that my mother also had a big falling out with her sister-in-law. Yes. That was very kind of you not to mention that, but that was true too. Okay, so lost relationships. Yes, I think, um, there's the loss of relationships, isn't there, through death. When a spouse, a long-term friend, a sibling, a child, or even a grandchild dies, and sadness and grief becomes overwhelming and becomes an unexpected daily companion. 
but to know that even at this time we, we grieve but we don't grieve without hope and that, that is a great comfort. A close friend of mine whose husband died last year said, the Bible has wise advice for us to mourn with those who mourn. True sympathy is being beside someone. Don't pretend to understand what they're going through, what they're experiencing, but acts of kindness showing real interest in the one who has died and letters and phone calls and visits are a great way to start. Remember, remember Psalm 23? God is with us even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We might be on our own, but we are never alone. Do you want to add anything? No. We've entered a phase, haven't we, where Christine and I pray each night for five or six folk who have lost their, uh, their loved ones in the last even 12 months. We've reached the point in our lives when our friends are in that situation. And, and we've learned things from the, those who remain. We've learned things in the last 18 months, I'd say, yes. that we didn't really know before. Yes. Uh, you go to church with someone who's lost their husband or their wife recently. Again, you've given advice, but how would you summarise it? I don't know. How would you summarise it? <laughs> well, I think your advice was, it's interesting that this lady said, this sister of ours, this Christian, this dearly loved Christian sister of ours said, don't pretend to understand. Yes. Don't say, oh, I understand. Yes, because you don't. Because you don't. But talk about the person who died. Or rather, yes, and create the conversation Session. in which they can talk about the person who's died. Yes. Yeah. Hmm? Okay. okay. Yeah. So there's broken relationships, there's lost relationships, and then there's our relationship with God. And Peter raised that as he talked about the psalm. But this is a time when we really can think about our relationship with God. Often we've put off doing anything about our relationship with God because we've always thought we'll do that later. Well, this is later. There's no later than this. Um, um, another friend. We don't have that many friends, but this was another one. And uh, he said um, he, was, he was dying and we talked about his funeral. And then Peter asked, what's going to happen to next? Because we weren't sure what their relationship with God was like. And he said, I'm going to heaven. I was a bit shocked actually. How do you know, Peter asked. And they said, you know, it's only, tr and Peter said, then said, you know it's only trusting in Jesus that he died to save you that you can know that and have forgiveness. And then he said, I know. And it's sometimes, you, I guess as people are approaching that time in their life when they know that this is, they're going to go, that they start to think about what life is all about what and about God and have and I guess for all of us it's a time to think about this and have you thought about your relationship with God we have this time to think about it maybe you've taken God for granted or you really haven't thought about him much in your life so far on the other hand you might have become slack about him. The busyness of life might have caught up with you and you've put God on the back burner. And that's what we do. Remember, we are God's workmanship created to do the good works he's prepared for us to walk in. What can I do for the kingdom of God today? 
And how can I thank him at the end of each day? Three things for what has happened to me. Um, I've got three things for today. One of them's been here with you. And then there's wisdom and perseverance. And Peter raised that too. But just think about it for a moment. Who are you? I guess you wouldn't say you are a wise person. I noticed Peter said he was. But the path of wisdom is wise because the path of wisdom is knowing the Lord, which means to trust him. You can bring together your life experience and your knowledge of the scripture. And you know, in my opinion, the first gift of wisdom is to point others to Jesus by word and deed. In our Bible study group in this last term, we've been looking at 1 Peter, and I've noticed that throughout that epistle, Peter talks about, yes, we have to speak the word of God. We have to have an answer for the faith, the hope that we have. But also, we need to live out our lives so that people might be one without a word that our lives are examples of God's work in them. And really, the second gift of wisdom, really, is to listen before you speak. Listen. Do you listen? That is to absorb the other person's life. And the third gift of wisdom is not to force your opinions on others. I think that's hard, especially as you get older, you have definite ideas and it's hard not to force them on others. James says in chapter 1 verse 19, we are to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger. Our temptation is to be slow to listen and quick to speak often on and on and on rather than being quick to listen and slow to speak. You know, um, in, in my life, living with Peter's dad was, um, I never even thought about doing that, but it was actually a wonderful experience to share my life with him. And he was the most gracious man um, he, he never criticised us at all and we must have irritated him beyond measure at times. The only thing he did say once was about tacos. He didn't like tacos but apart from that he never criticised our family life and it was chaos at times. Um, and so um, I wish I could be as self-controlled as he is. I try to be, but it was a good example for me. Did yes, you I, find... I have to uh, um, dissent from you. Oh, really? Because he did criticise me. Well, <laughs> he didn't criticise me. No, of course, well, <laughs> that would be hard to do. But uh, no, I was driving once and he was beside me in the car. We had the children in the back. I was dri we driving off to football Saturday morning. And he said to me very quietly, he said, is this how you want the kids to drive? <laughs> that was a, not something I could easily that, reply to. That was a pivotal moment, it, wasn't it? It was. A, it, that's interesting because... We, we have fragments. We have moments where we learn something from somebody. Yes. It's not as though we learn and learn and learn. Every day we're learning something fresh from people or something like this. But there are moments which stand out, aren't there? Yes. Where someone has said something or perhaps not said something which penetrates. And it just is the case that I think grandparents who aren't parents, who aren't the parents of these children, can sometimes say something or ask the right question or be there at the right moment uh, for a significant, unforgettable point for the child. I suspect that that's true. No one's ever said I've done this, but it, I, it's certainly, as I look back over my life, I think that is true. 
I think the impact of Grandpa, I know you're now Grandpa, but the, the real the Grandpa, grandpa right? yes, the, the one who lived with us. The impact of him on our family is that um, each of our children has one child that has his name in their names, and I think, um, I think that's quite precious. It that, is. That they, they had such a relationship with him that they were able to do that. And we were able to share our life with him. And he, I remember when he first had, we, came, we had family prayers at the dinner table. We used to have it in the mornings, but because one of our, Michael went to university and he didn't get up in the mornings, we had to change our pattern of life. And he, um, and Grandpa was there for family prayers, which he'd never experienced before. No. Mind you, it was chaos, I felt. The phone always rang. Somebody always wanted to go to the bathroom. And it was just, um, it wasn't what you call the perfect teaching situation. But he was part of that. And he really liked it and was enriched by it. And his being there, his being there and being part of it, of course, spoke volumes to the children. children yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, uh, what was his advice to grandparents? We ought to say this, by the way. We should. He always said, you keep your mouth shut and your wallet open. <laughs> okay? And that is very good advice, you know. He kept that rule. He kept that rule. Occasionally breaking it, to so point you, out my... Well, you were a son. I was a son. Yes, yeah. that's perfectly... Yes, and yes, perfectly true. He was... It was extraordinary, but... It, it was extraordinary because of who he was, but it was, ex but it it harked back to to an era when you did have several generations living under the same roof. Yes. We don't these days, but that was actually part of growing up. That was part of what shaped families. It was not just simply mum, dad, and the children, but other members of the family as well. And the business of raising children is not simply letting them learn everything they can from their peers. That's a mistake but to learn from people in different age groups, including grandpa and grandma. I, I, but I guess uh, what has happened is that now um, in families, both husband and wife work often, and, and the, the houses probably aren't big enough. No, no. We were blessed in living in a big house yeah. so that, that, that it worked. We had yeah. our own space. Yeah. Yes, it doesn't mean that we go back to that, but rather that we make up for it in other ways. That might be important, that, that, uh, that we keep in touch with families uh, as far as possible, make sure that we don't neglect our, those special relationships that God has given us. As Christine pointed out, I observed again and again how it was the prayers of it. I always say the prayers of a faithful grandmother are the most powerful prayers in the world. And uh, I saw that in people coming to Moore College. That was perfectly true. And the prayers of a mother as well. Oh, of course, the prayers of a mother, naturally. Well, I always remember Augustine's mother. Yes. Who he paid tribute to because um, he said that she prayed for me through all my ups, well, I'm paraphrasing. I don't have the eloquence of Augustine from memory, but she prayed for him in all his um, ups and downs in life and the, diff the wayward things he did. Yeah. And he acknowledged that it was through her prayers that he came to know the Lord. Yeah. And her name was? Monica. 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 <laughs> you can read about her. Be a Monica. Be, Be a, a Monica. Monica grandmother. Yeah. If you were ever, yeah. Or a Monica aunt or godmother. I've interrupted you on the wisdom front. Well, I think um, I was going to say in a way, I was going to finish there and say, don't waste your life. Um, don't waste this season of life that the Lord has given you. It's a special season. Um, but in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says there's a time for everything. And uh, we have um, this season. There's a season for everything under heaven. And if God has brought you to this season, Think about what he wants you to do, what good works he has prepared for you to walk in. 
and I think about it as God has placed me in this this time and is keeping me here for a purpose as I hobble around but I have a desire to fulfill that purpose I won't always do it perfectly I'll make mistakes and um, and be irritable and uh, cranky, I suppose. Never. Never. But he's put me here for a purpose, and I'm not going to waste it. Don't you waste it. And remember what um, Paul says in Corinthians about love, because I think that applies to us at all ages, really, mm -hmm. but even now. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Oh dear. Um, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I guess we won't be perfect in all that, will we? Uh, no, that's a picture of the Lord Jesus. I don't think yes, we'll really be perfect. No. No. But it's what a, what a picture of what being an adult is, what being the real adult that we're heading towards, because we're children, but we will be the adults that that describes there. You used the word earlier, generosity. Yes. And I think asking yourself, that's just the same thing, just asking yourself to be generous, or how are you going to be generous, I think, is uh, an expression of just that love there, uh, and it's wonderful. Uh, I have to say, there was another thing that I should have asked you, or mentioned earlier as well, that you say and you taught me. What was that? Uh, oh, yes, I remember. Always, it is better... To stand up close than back too far. It is better to stand up close than back too far, so that when someone else is suffering, our instinct is to turn back and to say, oh, they don't need me at the moment, they'd rather not. I'd rather leave them on their own. Yeah. But yeah. I think, as, as my fr friend here said, yeah. it, you need to get in touch in some way. Um, uh, sometimes it is just a text or an email, but that's a start. It's better to do something than nothing. Peter. <laughs> and in that way, love is fulfilled. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now um, I think that's, that's the gist of what we wanted to say. As you can see, it's not, uh, it doesn't arise out, of, we're not gonna write a book on this. Uh, <laughs> we're not experts on age or aging. We're not experts on, you know, all sorts of things. The only expertise we can claim is that, like you, we can read the Bible, and we've read the Bible, that the Bible surrounds us with the God who is sovereign over all things, is in charge of all things, and we can testify from our personal experience that the God who is the God from everlasting to everlasting has been with us in some very, very difficult times, very difficult times. And he has never failed us, never forsaken us, and never left us. We can testify to that. We are assured of it by his word. And we can say that whatever times lie before you or us, we can be confident that our God will walk with us. And that what makes us so different from the secular mindset, for we have a better story. We have a better story. One with our great friend with us walking with us and helping us to find and do the good works that he has prepared for us to walk in day by day. God be thanked. Indeed. Do you want to pray? Sure. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your mercies to us. We thank you that you are from everlasting to everlasting, that you are our safe stronghold. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are these things and you will be these things as we march each day towards you and towards that moment when we will grow into the likeness of our Lord Jesus. In the meantime, we pray that you would help us, each one, to be changed from one degree of glory to another as you work in our lives. We pray, Heavenly Father, for anyone listening to this who has not made their peace with you or who have become slack and apathetic in the things of God, 
And we pray that you would help us to repent and turn to you. We pray for those who are struggling with broken relationships. And we do pray for great wisdom to know how best to go forward, whether it's simply to pray for the other person, whether it's to reach out, how it is that we can forgive others, even when they have deeply wronged us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help all those who listen tonight and later uh, to deal with these problems. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us all to grow in wisdom so that we may know best how to reach out to others, how to love others, and how to serve others. Give us generous hearts, we pray. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that every day may be filled with the good works that you have prepared for us to walk in that day. And so we commit ourselves and our whole lives into your gracious hands, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We've got... Um, thank you so much, Peter and Christine. We've got lots of questions, and feel free to keep um, texting in your questions. We've, do you want to stay here? Because it's going to happen very soon. Okay. <laughs> um, and we'll just need to um, make sure that we speak loud enough as well. Um, do you want to, would you like a drink of water? I will. Thanks, yeah. Jane. Um, the first couple of questions have got to do with um, um, people who are not are married to people who aren't Christian. So I'll, I'll just, there's a couple of questions like that. So I'll read both of them out and then you could um, answer it together. Maybe? Okay. Yeah. Sure. So I'm newly retired and looking forward to what God has in store for me as I would love to increase my ministry. My husband is not yet retired, but is looking to in the next two years. He is not a Christian yet, but how would you advise me to organise my time so as not to cause a division um, between us? And another one, um, how would a Christian person balance serving God in their retirement if their spouse isn't Christian and has other plans? Thank you. I'll be quite interested in the wisdom that you have here. <laughs> Well, I think it's um, it's one of those one of those difficult. Thank you. Thank you. One of those difficult situations, isn't it? But I think, um, as I said, I've been looking at one Peter, and I think that encourages those, particularly wives who have unbelieving spouses, to um, trust God, and by your life, um, you will, you will, um, your husband will see your life and what you stand for. You might never live to see the outcome of your prayers, but don't give up, press on. And there'll be times when he might be playing golf and you might think, well, I can go to Bible study. You might be able to, um, balance things out so you can do other things but God knows and he the work that you might have to do is to be together with your husband so he can see your life more closely so what you're saying I think is in other words um, that in a sense you retain that responsibility to your spouse husband or wife uh, and, and that is the work that God has given that, uh, not the only work but that remains central to the works God has given you to do yes. and you mustn't resent the idea that, some, uh, that uh, this unbelieving person is taking up your time and demanding you uh, in ways but rather no, that's, that's the, the, one of the chief works God's given you to do yes yeah. Yeah. but one, t 1 Peter 3 yes yeah. mm. Mm. I think and we've known people in this situation? Yes. We have a friend at church like that, don't we? Yeah. And this is, uh, and uh, people find it difficult, but some of the most godly people that we know are in this exact situation. And just simply uh, serving the Lord by serving that relationship. Mm. I think so. I mean, I know that's what you said, but I thought I'd repeat it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Not at all. I'm going to use your mic, Peter. Um, thank you for your insights, Peter and Christine. I'm approaching retirement 
and am torn between working longer while financially supporting those in ministry and service or retiring and volunteering but not being able to offer as much financial support. Any thoughts? Go. <laughs> uh, well, there's no straight answer to this. It's not as though there's a yes, no, that, you, uh, that there's an obvious answer to it. Uh, I would think uh, the generosity matter comes in, and remember that Christine's first point on generosity was generosity of time. Uh, and it strikes me that sometimes uh, we, in earning a living, we forget the value of our time in the service of others. So I can't give an answer. It's not as though you can say, oh, you must do this, you must do that. No, I certainly couldn't say to you, oh, it's obvious, keep working and keep giving. You can't say that that's the obvious thing to do. A great deal depends upon who you are and what your gifting is and what the opportunities are. But it would certainly be consistent with uh, a godly way of life to say, well, from now on, my gifting is going to be put at the service of uh, my fellow Christians rather than my money uh, because I can do great things in that area as well. So either one's possible. Uh, it depends a great deal on who you are and the current situation. Don't think you've got to choose one or the other, but both, both sound very godly. And I would think as well, you might have been working all your life and want the opportunity to have a bit more freedom. And, that's, and to do that, it's not wrong to do that. I think to give you the opportunity to do things you haven't done because you've had to work. So weigh everything up and you'll come to the right answer. You touched on um, time there. Um, this question is, there's a principle that if you're not giving when you're not wealthy, you won't be in the habit of giving, sorry, there's a principle that if you're not giving when you're not wealthy, you won't be in the habit of giving when you are wealthy. Do you think investing with your time is like the habit of investing with your finances? Yes. <laughs> because generosity is not only, it, generosity is the single thing and it'll express itself in time and in money and so forth and so on. And so therefore it's, it's you could say, love. Uh, if I've not got the habit of love in all parts of life, it's unlikely I'll have it in some parts of life. So uh, we need to be careful that our gifting of money is not somehow a, a substitute for us actually doing the voluntary works or other works that God has given us to do. We need to be careful, particularly this relates to the previous question too, that our work life does not get in the way of the relationship building, which often these golden years uh, enable us to do. Uh, because it's relationships which are even more important. So in other words, um, the uh, generosity is, of a, is, is the key. Give yourself, uh, give yourself, give your time, give your money, uh, and give your gifts to those around you. Are you both home together more often than you used to be? <laughs> if, if, <laughs> if so, do you have any tips on systems or advice for being together a lot at home? For example, wanting to use the same rooms at the same time, hosting meetings at home, wanting to do very different activities? Uh, this sounds like it's very close to the bone. <laughs> well, I think COVID has exacerbated oh, yeah, this course. in our lives. Peter says since he's been redeployed, um, I tend to go out quite a bit. But with COVID, I've been stuck home. And, um, and so therefore, I'm intruding on his space. He's not intruding on mine. So he finds that... Um, anyway. Well... <laughs> So, thank you for the question. <laughs> What's the answer? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, a, a very significant question, and not just in COVID times. I think retirement changes so much, and uh, if one or both of you have been working and come in and spend a fair bit of time at home, uh, you find out things about each other that only the workmates knew, uh, that uh, may not be, well, it, it can be irritating. <laughs> 
So oh. it oh. can. So I, I'm I'm led to believe by others <laughs> that this could be uh, irritating. I found that Peter actually has the same habit as his father, who lived with us. When things were put away in the kitchen, it was hunt the item. Where do I think <laughs> Grandpa might have put this? And um, now that I'm doing more in the kitchen. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's an understatement as well, but it is... An overstatement, I think. An overstatement. Yes. But I, it is hunt the item. Yes. The strainer lives in the back of the cupboard in the bowls. Oh, I'll bear that in mind for next time. <laughs> well, uh, not necessarily. I mean, we're indicating that is a, that is a, a difficulty. Therefore, um, I mean, you may indeed engage in habits which, which mean that you make, you make a habit of going out and spending time walking, spending time playing golf, spending time doing what you do out, not just assuming that you're retired now, you will spend the whole time at home. This is something that I think you could be acutely aware of. I think men need to be particularly, men of our generation at least, uh, particularly aware of the, of the difference when you are at home all the time in a space that you weren't in all the time before. And I think it's a very it's a legitimate question and you may need to think about it and make practical decisions about going out and not being there and not being intrusive in the way. Uh, now, how that works out for you depends where you live and who you're living with and all sorts of other things like that. But yes, and I would say particularly husbands, let's think about this and be very practical about it, I would say. Unless you're a husband who's always lived at home and the wife has gone out all the time and now she's at home all the time. In which case, she should think about it. And it's not one size fits all either, is it? No, 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 it's not one size fits all. I think we've had enough. Yes. Shall we move on? Yes, we've got lots of questions to go. <laughs> oh, good. How do you cope with one day being wanted, needed, maybe in some cases the centre of attention, people wanting your opinion, etc., and the next day, this all seeming to be gone. <laughs> hmm. I actually think it's very hard. It's hard, um, but you do it in a sense, we need to move on. We need to move on so that others can serve the Lord and take up those responsibilities. We're not going to be here forever. But I do take heart that Ida Butros is the chair of the ABC and she's older than me. So I'm not giving up too soon doing certain things. But, but you know, we do need to move on um, and find the good works that God's prepared for us now. We kind of, your, your life changes along the way. Um, I think when you um, retire, then you have to, um, you have to refocus your life and um, and not just drop the ball and think, well, I'm here, what will I do? You've got to think, how can I do the good works God's prepared for me to walk in? Yeah, I think of Archbishop Lone here, uh, Archbishop of Sydney in the 1970s and early 80s, and a wonderful man, of course. Um, he told me, now, Okay, he occupied this senior position, but you could be a senior position in some company or some, whatever. His, his words to me uh, are not just applied to ministry, but are applied to people who have heavy responsibilities, say, uh, run your own business, do all sorts of things, uh, but are now no longer that. Uh, he said to me, Peter, it's a bit like playing cricket. He said, uh, you get out, you play a good innings, then you get out. And you go and you sit on the edge of the field and you deeply interested in what's happening next. Then after a little while, you move back into the dressing room and you watch from the dressing room. And then he said, you take your pads off and you actually, you don't, you don't care what's happening out there anymore. It's, you're not playing. Uh, and that's, I think Archbishop Lone uh, lived until his mid nineties. And it was interesting to see in, in the years after he was Archbishop, he had, uh, a great deal of preaching and teaching and this sort of thing to do. He was still actively involved, but as time went on, this grew less and less, uh, as it will, but he never ceased his one-to-one -one ministry with people. He was absolutely extraordinary in looking out and looking after individuals that he'd known. Uh, one story 
<laughs> someone else told me this that he went and visited a clergyman uh, who was very very ill just lying on the bed no you know they, he was on the point of death really and the nurse said here's the archbishop come to see you uh, Mr X and the guy stood sat straight up in bed it was Archbishop Lone come to see him, and he, he certainly started to talk to the Archbishop. When the Archbishop left, back he went, and that was it. Uh, and the Archbishop had that, had that gift. He didn't see himself as the centre of the whole business, and he didn't identify himself as the Archbishop, in his case, or the CEO, or the, you know, the, the communications manager of this company, he, or I am a lawyer. He didn't, he didn't identify himself as his role, but he wanted to bless other people. And he did it through preaching, teaching and writing. But when that fell off somewhat, he did it and all the way too, but he did it in the one-to-one -one caring for people. And we are still talking about it today, years after he died, because that's the man he was. Now, that's the person you could be. You don't have to be Archbishop Lone, but you could be that very person whose personal ministry to people of listening to them and asking them, how are you today? Or tell me about yourself. Listening and hearing and bringing the word of God to them could be life changing. Thank you. Some of my elderly friends, even my Christian elderly friends, seem to have grown bitter or cranky. Crumbling bodies and young people doing things differently and not listening to our wisdom all seems to get them down. Do you have advice for how to help them break out of that? Oh. <laughs> Thank Do you. These questions are funny, aren't they? <laughs> yes. Um, I wish. It's hard to solve that problem, isn't it? But you know, things move on. Things, look, life has changed. We used to use pounds, shillings, and pence. And now we use decimal currency. We've changed. When I was a young woman, everybody wore a hat to church. People don't wear hats to church anymore. We wore gloves, nobody wore gloves. You wouldn't wear trousers. A woman wouldn't wear trousers to church. So things have changed and everybody has adapted. I never ate spaghetti bolognese as a child. I ate, only ate spaghetti out of a tin. I'm sure everybody has changed. Even when you're old and cranky, you have changed. You can't expect things to stand still like they were before decimal currency came in. But you know, I think Sometimes it's hard because what we do when we meet God is like our heart language. And when that changes, we feel our relationship with God isn't the same, but it is. And we just have to, it would be good to encourage our friends who have got that edge to them to think about the things in their lives that have changed and help them, gradually help them to see that even church changes or and and they need to go with the flow so to speak because to see men and women boys and girls come to the gospel and be changed by coming to faith in Jesus is more wonderful than doing things like we used to do them in the 1950s anything else any other advice on dealing with a person who's old, bitter, cranky? I mean, Christians can be like this too, can't they? I think the, the body, the failure of the body is, comes as a great astonishment, <laughs> really, doesn't it? Uh, we could just no longer do what we did. I, I remember I've, the first time I realised this was I was walking down the street and a, uh, a middle-aged lady passed me walking along and drew away. And I was walking as fast as I could. And I thought, how can she do that? I'm a fast walker. And it was just one of those moments when you say, I'm no longer what I was. 
Okay, so but that's only a trivial uh, example. But but for people whose whose bodies are in serious decline, which means that they can no longer drive, for example, and so forth and so on. Um, any thoughts on a ministry in that area? Well, one of the things I've discovered actually during COVID, it's taught us lots of things. We've got lots of things to be thankful for. I post out. Uh, 200 letters every month to some women in in a organise in Mothers Union, and do you know I get letters back from people. I have only written um, half the letter um, and introduced them to a Bible reading by our uh, chaplain in our in Mothers Union, but they are so grateful for me keeping in touch with them, and it's actually a photo. Uh, a photocopied letter so I I feel unworthy of their thanks but I actually think keeping in touch with people loving them is one way of people seeing that that things are okay that even though life has changed that, that, that there are people out there that love them I think sometimes what happens, especially maybe in church, is that the older people are separated from the younger people. That's not the view that the Bible gives us. It gives us that actually older men and older women are to be examples to the younger men and younger women, and we're supposed to relate to each other. We don't park the older people to one side. So if you're younger, don't park the old and cranky people to one side, love them, invite them for a cup of tea. They would really like that. And even some scones, maybe. <laughs> In other words, crankiness, food. <laughs> it's Indeed. pretty good. Yes. Yeah. Love through food. Um, so, well, you just touched on this, um, this question, what are opportunities for elderly men and women to help younger men and women gain a broader perspective on what they might be going through at this moment? Not many, um, because of the way we've set up church and so forth and so on, I think. But that's a tragedy, because uh, uh, wisdom accumulates. Uh, not all old people are wise, but if you've been reading the Bible all your years and listening and mixing with God's people, a certain amount of wisdom does accrue. Uh, experience does that. Uh, and therefore, and it's, it is strange. Western civilization has become a little strange in the way in which uh, we treat el more older people. And so therefore it is as well, perhaps this is a problem, not perhaps for older people, it's a problem for the church as a whole, uh, to make sure that the, ex that the uh, relationships between the different age groups uh, is sustained and, and strengthened um, so that uh, the, the elderly can be honoured and, uh, and young people blessed and of course the older people blessed through the younger people. It is precisely what the secular world does not have and cannot have that we do. And uh, it, it, for those who have responsibility for churches, therefore, it would be good to see if we can make sure that, that, that those relationships are in place and uh, are working. Each of our small groups, perhaps, uh, should have a mixture of, of uh, the different age ranges in them. And respect for the opinion and insights of the elderly and the older is something perhaps that all of us ought to um, uh, inculcate. Um, I've always had the privilege of being in a mixed age Bible study group, even when I was here at college. And then subsequently, I've always been the older woman. And I'm still the older woman in the, in the Bible study group I'm in. But I love it because I learn so much from the people um, in my group as they share God's word with, with us and, um, and I share it with them um, and uh, I have relationships with them. I think one of our um, ideas that's come up in recent times is intergenerational church and it's not just church for the families, it's actually church 
for the church family, which includes the older people as well. Yeah, and also uncles and aunties. Yes. Uh, some, some of the most significant helpers in our the raising of our children were people 10 years, 15 years older than our children, uh, with whom they still keep in touch. Yes. It's interesting, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our son, one of our son, our son turned 50 this week, and his youth group leader, when he was in year seven, came to his birthday party, his birthday gathering. They're still friends. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, Christine made the comment about being in Bible study group, and 24 years ago, when I graduated from college, I um, was leading a women's Bible study group, and Christine was in it, and I was completely intimidated for the first little while, but I learned so much from Christine, and it was fantastic, so I can testify I learned a lot from her and have been learning still from her these last 24 years. Um, a comment first from someone and then a question from someone else. We agree with Christine that many country parishes like ours would love committed Christians to retire to our area and be of support to those of us ministering in the country, even young people and families to help us support their peers. Please consider and pray about this. Um, and then question, I feel busier and more tired than ever since I retired. My family relies on me for support and childminding and I don't like to let them down. Got any comments on that? Yeah. Oh, grandpa. Oh, grandpa. I think it's more likely to be grandma that says <laughs> that. Uh, yes, one of the things that uh, I think we failed with that we probably should not have uh, is the proper attention to ourselves of uh, the Sabbath day, of taking deliberate time, uh, and also of holidays. Uh, and we haven't mentioned either of those things, but those two also are part of God's gifting to us and the things, if you like, the good works we need to do, of withdrawal from our normal lives in order to do that. Now, you're looking pretty well at the worst two offenders in the world in regards to this. We are hoping that no one knows us well will be looking. But nonetheless, the, uh, but Saturdays were a big deal for us, weren't they? Of A time of change and, uh, and not doing the normal things. And of course, Sunday church. Yes. So the change of rhythm. And even our holidays were okay, weren't they? Yes, thank yeah. you. Any, anything else on that um, from your greater wisdom? Jane, can you just remind yeah, me at the sure. end of the question? Yeah, sure. I feel busier and more tired than ever since I retired. My family relies on me for support and childminding, and I don't like to let them down. So I guess that, you know, the commitment of family, but then also, you know, like one-to-one -one ministry and other things like that and balancing those sort of things. Yes. I guess, um, well, you all, it is hard and you work it out. So um, if my children ask, if I can, I will. That's how, but when you have 26 grandchildren, it's pretty hard to divide yourself and look after them all. And that never happens, even in the, the biggest families. And they know that I'm getting old and frail, so they don't ask so much, but when they're desperate, they do. I'm a backstop. So um, I think, I think you, you've got to, um, it's really hard to say because it's such a personal thing and how you work it out will depend on the things you like doing. And Is it wrong to say no, I think? To your good children. Well, the children are relying upon you to take care of their children. I mean, we're living in that sort of world now. This is yes. where the golden years are going. Yes. But is it wrong to look after yourself, do you think? No. I don't think, I think you should feel free to say, I'm sorry, I can't do it today. And, and for people to understand that. There'll be some different cultural, like cross-cultural, depending on your ethnic yeah. group. And things yes. Like. Yeah. Okay, we've got our final question. I've told my minister that I'm available to help out at church more now, I'm more now because I'm retired, but he doesn't seem interested. Oh, that's sad. Yes. <laughs> Well, silly him, uh, because uh, there are other opportunities. And as I say, Anglicare, uh, find somewhere else. Uh, 
And ministers differ. One di minister differs from another, as stars differ from glory. Uh, and <laughs> some have more imagination than others. Uh, and it may be that there's nothing particular, in which case, uh, uh, seek out. Don't, don't, you know, you are there. You've got gifting, uh, you've got the time and the energy to do this. Uh, if, that's, if that door is not opened, then it'll be because the Lord has another door for you. And uh, look for it. Look for it. Because, uh, as I said, when I asked my man at Anglicare, uh, were, uh, were they interested in volunteers, uh, uh, he bubbled with enthusiasm at the idea. Uh, I mean, our next door neighbour helps out at, um, helps out at uh, the State Library. Now, that's a secular organisation. Uh, he helps out there. They're keen to have volunteers. I can't believe that uh, voluntary labour is not in hot demand and particularly for Christians and Christian work. So but I think be disappointed, but move on. Except that I think if you go and offer a particular thing, rather than just say, what would you like me to do? He probably can't think of anything. But if you go and offer to do something particular, he'll probably be very, very grateful. So look around your church and see what you think needs doing and see if you can do it. I mean, sometimes even helping with the playgroup at church, cutting up the fruit, or if you're allowed to do that these days. Um, but there's opportunities there for people to do things like that. If you look around and you make the suggestion, take the initiative. Don't take no for an answer, I'd say. Is there anyone you want me to visit? Yes. Uh, what can I pray for? Um, yeah. By the way, I just remembered, I have a, a, a gentleman who lives in Melbourne, uh, studied at Moore College many years ago, but he got in touch with me, and uh, every he doesn't badger me, but every month or so he gets in touch via a text and says, praying for you, which he does every day, and he says, you know, what can I pray for for you? Isn't that a great ministry? Isn't that, and I've always had people around me who have prayed for me without being intrusive, but who have prayed for me. In fact, numbers that I didn't know were praying for me. We had that experience too with uh, uh, a man who came to us and said, oh, I stayed with you about 15 years ago. How's your son? I've been praying for him every week since then. <laughs> That's the good works that God has prepared for us to walk in and we're never gonna retire from them. Keep them up. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Peter and Christine. We're thankful to God for you both, and we're thankful most of all that you do fear the Lord. And um, I, we thank you to you for um, joining us tonight, and we hope that you found that really helpful and an encouragement and a challenge for you to keep on serving the Lord, um, whatever age or stage of life that you are in. I'm going to ask um, Mark Thompson, the principal of Moore College now, to close in prayer for us. But please, as I said earlier, look on our website. We've got other events coming up, um, and also if you'd like to study here as well. But thank you, Mark. Thank you, Peter, Christine. It's great to have you here. And uh, special thanks to um, the Gospel Coalition Australia. Uh, this partnership that we've been in in presenting this uh, night is something that's really important to us and we're very, very, very thankful for it. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you do not fail your people and that you are those everlasting arms that are always beneath us carrying us through times that are hard, uh, enabling us to rejoice in the times that are good. We pray that you might so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. We pray, Father, for those who are on the verge of retirement, uncertain about what lies ahead, that you might encourage them by the things that uh, we have heard together tonight. We pray for those, Father, who are in the midst of redeployment, and seeking to know how they might best use this moment to bring glory to your son and benefit to your people. And we pray that you might give them wisdom through tonight. And for each of us, as we look to those good works which you have prepared for us to walk in this day and each day, we pray you might open our eyes, give us generous hearts, 
enable us to love as we have been loved. And all of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.